Tales from the Tavern was recorded in front of a live Twitch audience. I'm Commander Shepard, and Tales from the Tavern is my favorite stream on Twitch. are still all screwed up okay so as i said we were having some tech issues hi everybody we're back with tech issues there's star you can see her lovely face now <laughs> you can't see me i'm hiding i'm hiding behind a pillar in the tavern so oh god it's been a night i can't tell you how many times Streamlabs has crashed tonight like a lot there i am hi right i know oops wrong camera turned off the wrong camera uh, I want to turn off that camera. There we go. Um, unfortunately, we had a guest who ended up having to drop at the last minute because they were also having some tech issues. So there are only five of us tonight. Unfortunately, John's, uh, John's, uh, Wolf's Blood, I see your question. Where's Steve? Steve is what crashed the stream the last time. So Steve is going to stay hiding out in, uh, in his bedroom tonight. So for those of you who don't know who Steve is, Steve is my little red dragon who usually when something happens and a guest can't make it, I have a picture of Steve that comes up on the screen with us and he's very quiet and very shy and he doesn't interrupt anybody. Um, but unfortunately, uh, he keeps crashing Streamlabs tonight. So yeah. Um, so here we are. Okay. Now that we've gotten through all of that and we're all here and everybody's unmuted and the stream is still going, let's go around and have everybody introduce themselves and tell us a little about who they are. So uh, we're going to start with Carlos. Carlos, welcome to Tales from the Tavern and tell us a little about who you are and what you do and where we can find you around the internet. Thank you. Uh, it's so fun to be here. I am Carlos Cabrera and you can find my work at somethingclevergames.com. I'm a freelancer who has worked on Pathfinder first and second editions and I've done a little bit of voice acting as well and hopefully we'll have a new board game announcement coming soon. Oh that's exciting. I'm a big fan. Of, I, I haven't played second edition of Pathfinder but I'm a big fan of first edition so yeah. Um, yeah it's exciting to have you here. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Danny. Hi uh, I'm Danny. I You can find me on the internet as uh, DannyNat20 pretty much everywhere. Uh, I thought it rhymed good. I don't actually roll a lot of nat 20s. No DM does. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you can find me streaming on uh, Twitch at OnlyDansDnd, where uh, it's the only actual play made by just Dans before everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that whole idea. It's fun. Um, well, thank you for coming on tonight. It'll be great to get to chat with you a little bit. Uh, Julian, tell us a little about you. Hi! I'm Julian, also known as uh, Everyday Superhero. Um, I normally am found hosting Everyday Superhero Cast on a monthly basis, but currently I'm starring in I'm a Medic Mori uh, as Thimble, as my first foray uh, into streaming, and I'm super excited and uh, just humbled by being invited in the first place. <laughs> Well, I'm excited to have you, and uh, if you were here last week, you saw the trailer uh, video for I'm a Medic Mori. We had a couple of guests from uh, from DMDM Studios on last week as well, so uh, nice to have you here uh, joining us this week. And uh, Star making her how many appearance on here? I think this is seventh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you find a fun show to be on, you keep trying your darndest to it's get back. True. It's true. Star also gets a lot of frantic, like, 
hey, I have a last minute opening. <laughs> Any chance for free? <laughs> And there's always these points of like, how often is it okay for me to be like, I'll do it. You to pick me, pick me, I'll come. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I am Star Shinobi. You can find me at Star Shinobi on Instagram, Twitter, and DMs Guild. Uh, I make useful to pseudo useful D and D magic items um, that are actually being rebranded. They used to be the daily D and D magic, which is obviously not so daily. Uh, so we, they are getting changed into the magic Rolo decks. Um, I also play on a Pathfinder 2E Strength of Thousands campaign on the Waffles Maple Syrup channel every other Thursday. We're taking a break while Waffles and Syrup are over in Israel and we'll be uh, starting up again in March on the 3rd. So plenty of time to catch up on our seven episodes <laughs> before then, if you're interested. Definitely worth checking it out. Um, I know that that whole crew over there, they put on a fantastic stream and, and do a lot of really hard work and, and they're great. So definitely check out Waffles Maple Syrup's channel and go visit Star over there too. Um, and most of us haven't played before. So it's a great way to learn how to play Pathfinder as we are muddling our way through it. Yeah. <laughs> and Waffles explains it to us. <laughs> yep, it's, uh, he, he's a great DM too. So mm -hmm. yeah, definitely definitely suggest checking it out um well thank you all so much for coming on tonight let me tell you if you're new to tales from the tavern let me tell you a little about how the stream works and um oh, i swear to god um basically what happens is we take all of our questions from chat so uh if you are here for the first time and you have a question for anybody that's here, uh, the whole crew, just feel free to drop your question into chat and one of our moderators will make sure that I get it so that we can hopefully hopefully get to chat about uh, whatever your question is. Um, I am not taking questions about anything involving arm length rubber gloves or rubber gloves of any sort. If you were here last week, you understand why. Um, and if you weren't, then you need to catch up on either the uh, the YouTube or the podcast. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I had a whole bit planned. Are you serious? <laughs> no. okay. Oh, dear. abort! Abort the plan! Abort, abort, abort. the plan! <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> no. So uh, so basically, feel free to drop your questions into chat, and uh, and we will make sure that we get the chance to talk to them. If we don't have the chance to get to it, uh, hopefully we will be able to discuss it on Twitter further. Uh, let's see. If you are not new to the channel and you've been here for a while and you have some channel points racked up, we do have the ask my question next for a thousand channel points. You can have your question bumped up to the next one in the queue. There are three of those available every night. So, so God damn it, rubber, rubber gloves, latex gloves, whatever. Um, I mean, now that we've cost channel points, I, I mean, we can. Now channel points are involved. So I guess we're going to just have to start with that question. Um, all right. So. <laughs> So I love just, you, chat. Oh, my God. I'm just going to dive right in. Um, this, is the, this is the mayhem that happens. This is the mayhem that happens when you come here. I swear to God. All right. So starting with Wolf's Blood's question, how would you incorporate arm length latex gloves into your current campaign? Uh, it is the arm length that is the key here. Uh, I think I think. Um, uh, building in an NPC or a uh, character that is a veterinarian and just going full hog. <laughs> <laughs> Literally full hog. <laughs> I'm really glad I gave everyone a heads up about the glove yeah. situation last week because now they're expecting this. So. <laughs> um, I feel I like I thought last time. Uh, I did have a uh, an idea for a campaign I wanted to make where um, there's this sort of cliffside port city, but all of the water around the side of this cliff face is actually like basically murky and disgusting and filled with like sludge that people need to use like magic to get their ships through. So like there's going to be a part of the city guard that were basically like trade sanitation engineers. I could see that working for something like that. There you go. 
I run a lot of. Uh, oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. <laughs> I run a lot of uh, modern setting games, so it could like I feel like it could fit pretty well in most of those. Just any random dude, which I, would be funny. Like, yeah, there's a guy walking by a crowd who just has these arm length rubber gloves on. Um, but also <laughs> in just our only dance game, we uh, the way our little stream works is we can go anywhere in time and space per arc. And so, yeah, you could definitely throw them into a, you know, a future setting where they are with, like, you know, some crazy scientist with gloves up past his shoulders, even. Uh, which would always be a riot. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I would probably make it into some kind of joke in a way that just leaves it open to the imagination for my players. So mine very much like to go to taverns in just weird areas. And I feel like what I would want to do with that is have the barmaid ask, do you want any food? And when they say yes, just have her yell back that somebody wants the special and they watch one of the people put on some arm length gloves <laughs> and just go <gasps> and head to the back and just leave it open for interpretation. <laughs> oh, yes. That would be great. I love that. I think uh, for me, it would probably be a character prop like I would have a character that for some reason is carrying them all the time, like just some random, you know, some people have trinkets and that sort of thing. Like this would be their random thing that they just happen to have in the event that it comes in handy. Also, I'm a mom. So like, that's really the kind of thing that I would keep in my purse anyway. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, no, I, I think that's probably how I would play that off. And because inevitably you're going to hit like a swamp or, a you know, like something really sketchy and you're going to be like, I don't want to touch that. So, <laughs> yeah, I could see that being the case. All right, let's see. Uh, next question that we have is uh, this is from the Ink Den. And the question is um, when it... When it comes to playing D&D or Pathfinder games, what time period, past medieval time, present time, future, do you like playing in? Oh, can I start by saying I have yet to play Pathfinder, but it is on my list of things to do. Uh, and I hope to start with Starfinder because I've done mid, uh, fantasy medieval and D&D so much that I wanted to set it more apart. I've heard really good I, things about Starfinder. I haven't tried it myself either. I did a um, uh, a sort of like uh, gothic horror um, one shot in Starfinder that I think worked really, really well. But for uh, Pathfinder, I tend to like the traditional fantasy stuff. But as of this last Gen Con we just had, there was the Pathfinder special and the Starfinder special that crossed over with one another. Wow. And that was a lot of fun to play. I say I also haven't played Pathfinder <laughs> someday, <laughs> um, but I, as I said just a little bit ago, I usually run modern games uh, and pseudo modern. You know, usually not like our exact world or something, or even but something adjacent. You know, the multiverse theory. <laughs> um, but because um, I mean, I don't know. I I like when my players have cell phones. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just simplifies nice. a lot of things. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. Do you still use magic in modern setting games or do you switch to technology? I usually do. Uh, I would say there's a game I actually ran this morning where the idea of it is it was we take our exact modern Earth the way it is now and they couldn't solve global warming, so they crashed the Fey Feywild into our world and introduced magic to our world. Nice. And basically, oh, with that cool. idea. Yeah, it's like thousands of years in the future, but technology kind of just stayed the same because they had magic now. So they had to figure oh, everyone okay. just kind of focused on magic for a while. Um, there's a little bit of magic tech, but not too much. And so that's so usually magic is a thing, but so are cell phones and toasters and microwaves. <laughs> right. I mean, I I'm probably in the most boring here, but I really enjoy the deep fantasy Lord of the Rings setting D and D type things. Um, I mean, I'll, I also kind of enjoy, like, I've also played Wild Sea, um, which is kind of fun. It is essentially like a pirates on a sea of trees kind of campaign. And I guess that's about as far as I like to go technology wise in my games. But 
I mean, I guess that's just me. I like the challenge of not having a cell phone where we can call somebody and say, hey, we're looking for the answer in the library. It's like we actually have to we have to go there. But that's just my personal favorite of, you know, especially DMing, just being like, OK, they can call somebody. Now I have to figure out how fast they can move on that. That's a different kind of challenge as a DM. <laughs> Is that called Wild Sea, did you say? I gotta write yeah. that down. That sounds super cool. Yeah, Wild Sea <laughs> is pretty good. Um, like I said, it is essentially pirates. So the idea of Wild Sea is that the world was overtaken by trees. So the, you cannot reach the surface. If you do reach the surface, there's like toxins and there's creatures down there. So you sail ships on the treetops. That and it's so cool. It's actually pretty fun. It's <laughs> yeah. so we got to be pirates on a sea of trees. It's it's pretty great. And so it's things like you have to try and figure out how to do things without creating fires. Because if you start a fire, they can't stop them. Have, uh, yeah. as well? What now? Did the sea of thieves have trees as, or sea of trees have thieves as well? I'm sure they do. <laughs> well, we were. <laughs> we went pirate real fast. <laughs> I, uh, I just, so I did a quick uh, look up for it. Was that uh, something that was just recently on Kip Kickstarter? It's, I think so. We got a hold of it because our, our DM had a copy, so. Yeah. But yeah, if you can get a hold of Wild Sea, it is, it's pretty fantastic. You get to build your ship, you get to build your crew. It's pretty great. <laughs> I know that um, sometimes Pathfinder has ended up in like, the modern world or like as recent as the 1920s one of their most famous adventures is just called Rasputin must die oh, yeah i've heard of that one that sounds really neat um when i was playing pathfinder first edition my campaigns were both um high fantasy you know high fantasy settings uh high fantasy medieval um they were both you know typical uh, adventure paths. One was the Curse of the Crimson yeah. Throne and one was um, uh, Rise of the Rune Lords. So uh, ironically set in like sister cities. <laughs> yeah, I would love to have a fantasy campaign end up in the modern world and that might be what I'm working on for a mobile game project off on the side. We'll see how that goes. Ooh, nice. I am very yeah, excited. Right. I would love that. Uh, <laughs> Sega? Might be as in not allowed to talk about it yet? Uh, no, so this is just sort of like my passion project I've been doing mm. for some time now. Um, it actually sort of how it ties into how I got my first official freelancing gig. Um, so I wrote like the cornerstones of the setting, like how some of the ways the world works and what happens when you cross over. And I wrote a lot of that stuff up for Pathfinder 1 and then when I went to um, PaisoCon for a number of years, I'm local to Seattle, I ended up showing some of that to a third party publisher for Pathfinder back in first edition days. And that got me my first gig professionally. Nice. So yeah, my, side, awesome. my, my side project sort of launched my freelancing career, which is sort of awesome. Oh, yeah. That's so cool. Um, I've been doing a lot of testing. Well, at least I will be doing some testing soon because um, I had this thing happen where I left my day job to work on my game and my business full time in 2019, like two months before my partner at the time lost her job and had had to go back to oh, the job no. I just left. So I'm just like just starting to pivot now back to that particular project. But I bought some new like platforms to start doing some uh, build testing on. So that's where I'm at right now. Very exciting. <laughs> that sounds awesome. I I typically play like the high fantasy setting, but I've started venturing into like more sci-fi stuff mm -hmm. lately. My last, well, my last my last one shot that I did was a it, it was definitely a fantasy campaign. We were playing Mouse Runner, so you know we were sentient mice. Um, <laughs> but uh, the one that I had done right before that actually was the Mothership RPG, which is a sci-fi mm. horror system, and um, which is like way outside of the realm of my comfort zone, and I had a blast. I had so much fun playing it. Definitely recommend that system if you haven't checked it out. Um, that was a good one. I've heard some good things. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was yeah, there's, 
There's one that will be coming out on Kickstarter here this year that I'm very excited about that I definitely want to try of uh, Deep Breath. I don't know if you've heard of Deep Breath, <laughs> but um, Casual J is uh, creating one. It is essentially an anime created uh, RPG system. So it's a little bit more like cyberpunky, if I'm understanding correctly, but it's things like you can play as a Gundam person or you can play as a Super Saiyan that also has Naruto powers. Like it's it's pretty awesome and I'm excited. Um, I got to play with Jay for a, um, a Theros based D&D adventure and he played the Titan cat class from that and it was bonkers. <laughs> I believe his last strike that he did in our campaign was over a thousand damage. Oh my god. Oh wow. Yeah. Because he used a like wish Final spell. Fantasy damage numbers. <laughs> oh yeah. Like it was like he turned himself into a meteor using a wish spell and his titan powers and it was it was insanity and I loved it. <laughs> I love high level play stuff like that. Yeah. That can be so much fun. I'm definitely going to have to check that out. Oh, yeah, my oh. list just keeps getting longer. I know. It's, everyone's got like little notes on the side. It's like, let's do this one. <laughs> also having that realization that I've played more systems than I think I have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. It's always when somebody is like, that question comes up and I'm always like, oh, wait, I've played this. Oh, wait, I've played this too. Oh, oh, wait, I've played yeah. this too. <laughs> oh, yeah, I tried I, this. I, oh, yeah. My Most of my history has been um, with uh, 5e. Um, mm -hmm. but I'm modifying what I need for the players to have the most fun. Um, I only recently started taking those mods into systems that fit it differently. Um, but I'm always afraid to do that with, with a group that also doesn't know that, know the new system. Mm -hmm. I had, I had the best success. Have any of you played, uh, Dread? With the the Jenga blocks, I haven't, but I was just I I've heard about other people on here t talking about it, and I was just describing it to somebody else, and I was like, I've got to play that sometime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the first thing I ever DM'd because it my my favorite part of of tabletop is um, the camaraderie around the table, um, not specifically the RP or the improv, but but just feeling uh, feeling off of each other. Um, and uh, there's no character sheets. There's just descriptions, and uh, there's not really stats because there's a Jenga tower that represents all your decisions, uh, and and everything's thriller or horror based. So like, the further you get in the story, the more rickety the tower gets, the more terrified you get as you get into the story. Um, and I played a really fun game called Long May She Rain that uh, embedded the tower as a. Um, uh, a, uh, a, time, a time loop for the players. So every time uh, the tower got knocked over, they had to restart at the very beginning at the intro monologue, and they couldn't skip it. And you didn't tell them that there, there was a time loop. So the first time through, they die on like a railroaded intro, and then you knock down the tower they've been working on, and they just yell at you and cuss at you, and you do the intro without any, any like... Uh, uh, warning or like pausing or letting them talk over you and you just keep going and start over until they realize it uh it, it was so much fun that is one thing that i've always wanted to figure out how to do well in a campaign is get a time loop into the game yeah that, that worked really well i've i've wanted to do that since i heard them do it on the adventure zone and i just don't know how to execute it correctly <laughs> <laughs> there was a real clever use of a jenka set that was Part of a couple of, of events that uh, unfortunately are no longer um, around PAX here in Seattle. It was the um, oh, was it the uh, the HP Pubcraft Love Crawl, Ooh. and you did bar hopping, and then there was a guy who would walk around with dice that would just walk up to your table, and at the start of the event, everyone would just get their little character sheets of who they were, and you had red bands on your left for your health and blue bands on your right for your sanity. And as you went to the different bars, your character sheet would have a little list of these are the things you need to drink to restore your health or your sanity. And one of the locations had a Jenga set where you had to pull certain pieces 
that had a key drawn on them to unlock a clue for the mystery because there were other NPCs in the group with us acting as secret cultists. And in order for us to um, basically not find enough clues so that they would come out on top, they would try to coerce other people to take the wrong pieces from the Jenga set. <laughs> and we just went like a big circle around the Jenga set trying to figure out where the clues were and the cult was trying to make us screw up. It was pretty good. That's so cool. That cool. <laughs> Very fun. Tomorrow I'm going to play a game with a Jenga set for the first time uh, called Starcrossed. Uh, it is um, oh, my my partner who's in the chat, Claire the DM, we're going to play it on Valentine's Day because it's about you play Starcrossed lovers. Um, oh, that's cool. And, um, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a very nice little holiday. Um, but uh, yeah, where you just, you know, you have to, you can be any kind of person. You can be aliens, you can be robots, you can be celestial bodies, whatever. Um, but something that is bringing you together, you know, in a way that's not possible for you to stay together. And that's, so you pull all these and the Jenga blocks aside how well it goes. <laughs> that's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. I like those. I like the idea of those games that have like, I mean, I, I admittedly am a, an, a, am a bit of a dice addict, but I like those games that use other stuff to determine, you know, like the Jenga towers or, you know, other things like that, that you can incorporate in. I always think that that sounds like such a clever clever way to do it yeah um, all right let's see uh cc is in chat and cc would like to know have you ever pulled off a good horror scene in a ttrpg and what system was it yes yes i have <laughs> oh um, now we want details players that were playing the game uh to answer than me uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I I recently run a one shot a couple times, the last couple weeks. That uh, was a mix of a. It was a five e. It was, but it was. Um, yeah, it was in five e. But it was a mix of a monster and a house story with a whodunit mystery. Um, there was very little initiative, and it was just the three people running around in a boat that they didn't know how they got on there, finding dead bodies and solving the mystery. Uh, and there was a haunted um, blade that had a ghost uh, that would like try to possess you if you touched the blade. And uh, most the strongest reaction was just uh, tr learning that they're stuck, uh, that they're on a crime scene, and the crime and the crime scene's traveling basically to the Royal Harbor. So they have to either like solve the mystery and get off the boat, or like kill the ghost and drive it themselves. Uh, and trying to not freak out or like die uh, had people very excited. I don't know if it was scary for them, but yeah. That does sound like fun. Um, I was running a Star Wars game back in the Saga Edition rules before Fantasy Flight picked up the license. And um, during an early encounter, this took place literally three days after Order 66. So like half my party were clone deserters or basically four sensitives on the run from the Empire, which is perfect. And there was a clone commander that they brought down to exactly zero hit points by shooting a thermal detonator in his hand. And they didn't have time to check the body because they had to get out of dodge. So later on in the campaign, I said, okay, we're doing a one shot tonight here's four character sheets yeah. and each of the characters were other troopers doing a cleanup squad of the location that they just escaped this dude from so they were in this imperial place they were like creepily patched together droids coming out of the darkness there was a mysterious um clone commander with one hand and a vibroblade strapped to his arm he just methodically took out each of the players one by one. It's a full TPK in this one shot just to show that this guy was still alive. And then when the party later on was trying to do some jobs for the bounty hunters guild just to keep their cover, 
this guy hunted them down. And I said, this is the clone trooper with one hand and a vibro blade stuck to his arm. And there are four red streaks on his helmet from the previous kills of the one shot. He's ready to go. And one of the things that made him so terrifying was that uh, advanced soldiers um, through this one particular talent path can just straight up ignore damage for a round. Mm. So my players, especially the Force Sensitives, were like, I deal 60 damage to this guy. He's going to ignore that this round. <laughs> so they were like literally pulling into the Force and using dark side points just to get this guy off their tail. Wow. Huge, huge win. Oh, and then uh, there was this one other session where I just put the fear of God in everyone at the table just because they saw a hologram of Darth Vader, not even really him. Oh, wow. I just said that there was a hologram and everyone just like, <gasps> everything stops. Yeah. 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 I guess I haven't done a ton of horror in mine. Um, one of them, I mean, I, one of them had just was based on like the true, like, background of hags so i don't really want to explain that one too much because that one could be triggering to people depending on what they don't like so i'm just gonna go ahead and skip on that one um but <laughs> uh, another one that i did was a while ago there was uh someone put out stats for the bone fairy um which is you know don't why are you afraid of the tooth fairy when she brings them to the bone fairy kind of thing and there was this great art that came out and so I created this character that has essentially killed this wood and turned it into a living undead forest. And they had to go in there and try and defeat her, but she had complete control. So there's complete darkness and fog and she'd just kind of show up where they were without them being able to detect her. And so it was like just kind of being hunted by something they couldn't see until she was there. And that was probably about as close as I've gotten to horror, but my players also feel invincible to this day, so horror is kind of hard to, to pull on them. <laughs> I've, I've found that too. Yeah, I have... Oh, sorry. No, no, I was just gonna say, I have six level 12 characters. If I don't throw a CR 20 at them, there's no sweat whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. I, I've realized that my um maybe because they're looking forward to combat so much that by the time it's happening even even if it's a terrifying monster that's probably gonna kill them uh they're not afraid of it so uh so i i try to get stuff in through ambiance of like where they're walking or like the 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 suspense before jump scare uh because once they're in initiative all that kind of leaves their mind because they're mm -hmm. looking at their uh sheet the entire time mm -hmm. it's a good idea yeah. But yeah, I also don't run a ton of horror. Um, I say that as someone who like runs Call of Cthulhu games. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll say most recently I ran a, a DD game at, where the players had entered the Abyss. And does anyone know heard, know about the Lumara? They're like a D&D &D monster race. Um, they're basically demon spirits that possess dead bodies. Uh, so they make undead by possessing their bodies which is kind of when they have like all these abilities where they like literally just like vomit up blood and stuff to be scary Whoa. <laughs> um that's kind of cool the, yeah and that's why i ran a, a couple of like an adventure there in like a play a layer of the abyss that was just like mausoleums full of these demon spirit zombies uh but what was really finally scary about it was like the leader of it was a lumara that was possessing the body of a past archon so it was like this the undead angel thing and totally almost instantly killed one of my players. Luckily they had a revivifying things and they all ran away immediately. <laughs> but, uh, which was the point they should have ran. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but that was very fun. Um, they actually exercised the Archon and got an Archon friend for later. But, um, and I'll say my, one of the, I haven't ran Call I say I run Call, Call of Cthulhu. I haven't ran it in at least a year. Uh, just because no one's commissioned me to do it. The last time I got commissioned was a, um, not this this New Year's we had just had, but the New Year's before, a group wanted to do like a special New Year's Day, like New Year's Eve uh, game in this, in Chicago where they lived. 
And so I had I made like this very scary eldritch like phoenix creature uh, that was going to you know like burn everything and to reborn it from the ashes like a New Year's and that was uh, very fun. They um, the amount of soot soot can be very scary. I found. Yep. <laughs> um, so that was that was very fun as well. <laughs> I just had the thought, though, I did have my character, my players encounter a death knight, which they readily handled, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I just had the realization that only one of my players actually knows that death knights don't die. So that's going to be fun. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Every time my uh, Star Wars players leveled, I would be like, all right, give me a copy of your character sheet. I want to know the new things that you picked up. So, like, I would deliberately set up encounters for things I knew could hurt them. Like, I want to put the fear in my players. Like, I know all of your weaknesses. Show me every level. <laughs> yeah, that was actually going to be my question. Uh, do you uh, uh, ever, or how often, do you purposely put in an encounter that you put in to be unwinnable? Does that make sense? Like, not, not like a... Not from a puzzle or trap, but like a character yeah. like that clearly is going to entice them to fight, but fighting is the wrong option. I usually prepare like two or three different scenarios depending on what direction the players will go in, and your players will still surprise you. Um, right. But I always try to at least put in something that if they tried, winning would be possible. So like nothing that's unwinnable, but if they all like coordinated their tactics, expended most of their resources, they might be able to pull it off. And even if they have to retreat, then they know this guy's probably gonna show up again. Yeah, yeah. I mean I've I've done it once and they still won the fight. And I don't know how that worked. <laughs> but I, I mean it literally, as a DM, how many of you would think that, oh, if I throw, literally, not exaggerating this number, 68 zombies at them at one time, this is going to be a problem. No, didn't even down one of them. I don't, <laughs> like, but there's this moment where you're like, how did I miscalculate this in such a way that they beat 68 zombies? Like, this was supposed to be a, you guys need to run away moment, and it's, no, it, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, they just decimated all of them. No channel divinities, just hand-to-hand -hand combat. Wow. wow. And I'm just like, how the... <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> all right, second wave is coming. Screw <laughs> you guys. We're doing this again. Do it again. <laughs> Apache, yes, Fireball was involved for one shot, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but the character was a little tentative to use Fireball because she had just killed another player with it. Ooh. Yeah, with permission. Oh. Like she said, I'm going to do this. I yeah. don't want to do this. I'll hit you. And he went, hit, do it. Just take out, take out the beholder and hit me. And the <laughs> character died. <laughs> so yeah. she was a little tentative to use Fireball anymore. <laughs> I love playing rogues. And I'm like, oh, I only have this AOE spell. I'm like, uncanny dodge. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh, Uncanny Dodge is the best thing ever. Oh, yeah. For a player. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you just hit them with things that, you know, aren't dexterity base. <laughs> right. You gotta throw them some wisdom or some intelligence. But I'm immune to flank. Um, he's better than you. <laughs> <laughs> he's better than you. <laughs> This isn't flanking. This is a maneuver. Which one? <laughs> I made it up. <laughs> he moved in a straight line directly at you. Uh, and I just want to respond to Carrick. Yes, my PCs have killed more players than I have. <laughs> <laughs> I helped. <laughs> it was a team effort. I was going to say, it was a team effort. Quotes there or not. <laughs> <laughs> I I was the beholder that hit him with the death ray first. It's fine. <laughs> just your players finished them off. Yeah, 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 yeah. They just I I got the assist point. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's funny. I flipped the coin that killed him. It's it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Claire, the DM, had a question, which I always love this one because I always learn about great, great other systems. 
Uh, what are some of your favorite systems or games outside of D&D and Pathfinder? Hmm. Honestly, Quest. Yeah, I, that's the one I was thinking <laughs> too. <laughs> um, so I, I know for me, my problem is I enjoy crunchy games. The less crunchy it is, the harder it is for me to get into it. So Quest is kind of that great in-between of not having a 400-page rule book, but still having a little bit of crunch to it. Um, I have a very hard time with one-page systems that are like, here's the two attributes you have, make a character out of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not saying I'm not saying they're bad, it's just difficult for me <laughs> to, to work with. So I, I know they are amazing, especially for one-shots. But um, that and the other one that I enjoy is uh, Mictum. Um, yeah, it is it, it is a a small animal based system. So there was a lot of inspiration when I was writing disaster hamsters from that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's like you can play as a hamster or a small bird or combat wombat. Oh, yes. Wombat. <laughs> <laughs> um, or a hedgehog or yeah, you just play these small creatures. And it's it's fantastic. I would very much recommend Mictum. I have enjoyed a lot of um, World of Darkness in its various forms in the past. Mm -hmm. And one, I think the, the Fantasy Flight version of the Star Wars RPG came out. I was like, oh, it's a storytelling system. You have your skills and your attributes and you use the dice. Um, what I sort of did because I wanted to continue my Star Wars campaign so much is that I brought it over from Saga Edition to the Imperial Assault board game, which is sort of like a pretty good halfway point between classic D&D, Star Wars, uh, Pathfinder to what a storytelling um, RPG would be. Because Imperial Assault had a similar dice mechanic that the full RPG uses. So you had to sort of like go from one to the other like the jump from imperial assault to the rpg is really small i feel but the board game was great because you were still dealing with like square by square tactics but in a game with dice similar to what the new star wars and uh, storytelling systems were kind of like so it's a really fun blend between the two i thought i would say uh I, in contrast to Star, love one-page one-shot, one-page games. I play a lot of one-page games. Um, I, you know, play a lot of games that don't you don't have any character sheet at all, which I enjoy a lot. Uh, just you know, anytime I can make stuff up for with no consequences, I'm here for. Uh, <laughs> but um, that being said, there are a couple games that I really enjoy that do have things to read. Uh, <laughs> They're um, a game that I've just played a little bit that I can't wait to keep playing is a game called Sleep Away. Um, you make a summer camp with a, and you're all camp counselors and there is a evil monster that lives in the woods and there's magic and things. It's very fun. It's you make like a whole grid like conspiracy board of the way the camp looks with you know note cards and string and things. Uh, this is very fun. I. Also, I'm a really big fan of the game Masks, uh, New Generation, where you play teenage superheroes a la Teen Titans. Uh, <laughs> I am a big superhero fan of this whole shelf behind me is yeah, a yeah, couple yeah. hundred of my favorite comic books. <laughs> but uh, and it's I love that game because it's just it's just a 2D six system, but it is a, and it's a fail forward system. I feel like we don't get enough fail forward games, you know, where the more you fail, the more you level up. Uh, so you make a lot of uh, interesting choices, you know, you're not afraid to fail because you do get more powerful uh, throughout that, which I feel like is really very fun. <laughs> That's awesome. That, uh, that I haven't played it yet, but that reminds me of what I read in the, the Power Rangers RPG. Uh, they don't have death, they have um, uh, being... Uh, uh, obstacles to overcome for completing like your quest so like you you can pass and fail the quest but not your individual characters don't die uh so you hit like hardship and whatnot along the way i haven't actually paid it though um <laughs> i have uh, to give a shout out to 
one game I've uh, sort of dabbled with through the pandemic because it's a great investment. It's um, called Mobile Frame Zero, and it's a tabletop war game that you actually play with Legos. Oh, so oh. you make these little yellow these Lego robots, and when your robot takes damage, if you lose a system, you just pop it right off and put it on the table because that's where you took damage. It's fantastic. What was that one called again? Uh, Mobile Frame Zero. Okay. Uh, I already talked about uh, Dread, so I'm going to go with um, Cypher, because I played it yesterday for the first time. I didn't know it existed before two days ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it was awesome. Um, that, that was an experience of, of moving a style of gameplay to a system that fits it better. Um, and the, uh, the DM doesn't make roles. Um, they assign uh, through through understanding how the level tiers and levels of difficulty are, um, uh, like what a role needs to beat in order, order to succeed or fail. But um, all the roles are done by the players around the table. So like whether it's offense or defense or or uh, character attacking or not, you are play as a player are responsible for whether or not you succeed. Then it makes the players forced to interact with each other more. Uh, because they're not asking the DM for permission at any point. They're not. They're not a uh, uh, breaking character to be like, "Hey, uh, I need to do this." They're talking to the person next to them about trying to like get away from something. The DM just goes, "We'll make the roll," and then uh, you react to it, which I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never played that one, but uh, I've heard of other people talk about it, so. It looked really, really crunchy up front, uh, but it's more crunchy in that it exists in an algorithm. And then you just, once you know the algorithm, you just, it makes improv improvisation easier because you don't have to have a list of stats for all your monsters mm -hmm. or all the things you're fighting. You just, you have a, a tier of what you need and you can pop in and out as you need uh, throughout the, the session. Nice. I would have to say, so Star already mentioned Quest, which is another one that I love. Um, I mentioned Mothership, uh, which I really enjoyed when I did a one shot of that um, with uh, Todd Mood Bounce over on his channel. And then um, another one that I really like, uh, uh, Apache it shouted it out in chat, but is uh, Aether and Steamworks, which uh, was a Kickstarter indie system. Uh, written by uh, Ty Burris, who runs the Roll for Chaos channel, and that's a really fun system. It's a nice, like, sci-fi meets kind of like magic, and, um, you know, he refers to it as, as Aetherpunk. Um, but, you know, it's kind of got the, this look of, like, steampunk meets, meets like, fantasy-type characters, and, um, you know, you can have characters that have, like, a prosthetic arm or you know things like that so it's kind of this neat blend between the two and the system itself is really fun um, I've played it several times and always really enjoyed it so I always I always like to shout that one out uh, all right let's see any and does anybody have any other ones before we move on to the next question I didn't know if anybody thought of any other games they wanted to shout out that that's the entire list I've ever played Okay, That's, well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> I, was gonna say, I think I threw out the other ones earlier. Conversation. <laughs> I have a game that I haven't played that I've watched a couple times that I really love that people should check out. It's called Wickedness. Um, you play as a coven of witches, uh, which is a game made for three people. And uh, you use tarot, car tarot cards instead of dice or anything. It's just it's all ruled by the tarot. Oh, so, that's so neat. Fun. And it's, yeah, very cool. But I've never played it, but I've watched it a bunch. <laughs> there is one thing awesome. I definitely want to play that I actually have the book for and want to get a session going. It's called Night Witch. Mm. Um, and it's the, the story of the World War II female bombers. Oh, wow. Which was an actual real thing in history. And yeah. it's basically a campaign based off of their adventures. Cool. That's cool. Neat. That sounds cool. There's so many cool systems out there. <laughs> There's not enough time in the day. <laughs> I need more time to play games. 
Yeah, a lot of people get my money on Kickstarter just because I want to see their game like be made. I'm yeah, never going to get around to playing it, but here's my money. Yeah. Just shut up and take my money. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I will say that was one thing the pandemic uh, really did. Probably not so much for me as it did through me for other people was uh, I, because I was working from home for the majority of 2020 and 2021, um, I spent a lot of time looking at various Kickstarters and I was like, oh, this one looks cool. Back that one. This one looks cool. Back that one. <laughs> it's like, oh, I really need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, got a lot of dice in the last couple of years. I haven't sat at a physical table since 2019. Uh, um. <laughs> hey, man. You know, the worst part is I know I still have some coming <laughs> that I <laughs> yeah. uh, that I ordered before the pandemic started. Oh. And it's just one of those, yeah, so it's one of those, it's just, you know, the pandemic caused issues with logistics and stuff yeah. and they're still doing it. So kudos to them for pushing through. But it's yeah. that moment of, I looked at my dice the other day and was like, God, I have a lot of dice. Oh, no, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, because it's not like you just bought them. So No, no, no. I, I bought them a long time ago, and then I bought a bunch after that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Better. I feel that way. I think I, I think I backed at least four sets on Kickstarter just in the last two years. Like, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and I'm still, I think I'm only waiting on one of them now at this point, but that's like yeah manufacturing and stuff so mm -hmm. yeah that's one of the things pushing back my uh my board game like i'm not doing any of the heavy lifting i just sold my designs to a publisher yeah. so they're doing all of the hard work um but it's just like who knows when the kickstarter or the whatever that they decide to do is going to go up i i don't know yet so they're still trying to figure out the schedule Right. Um, we're probably at a good point now to pause for a break before we dive into another question. So why don't we take a quick break? Uh, we'll be out, you know, five, ten minutes-ish so everybody can get up, stretch their legs, hashtag free the pee, all of that good stuff. And uh, we will be back in just a little bit. Hopefully no more tech issues. And, uh, and we will answer any questions that come in during the break or the ones that we haven't quite made it to just yet. So we will see you in just a little bit. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Okay, this is the hardest part of any role-playing game. Who wants to be the dungeon master? I do! Me! me. Everyone? You could aid a desperate town in their hunt for a savage beast. Or sail to a hidden isle full of talking turtles. I love turtles. Or tracking down a band of pirates to save your best friend. Five DMs, five great ideas. I guess we'll have to play them all. Hey, Set sail with us for a podcast adventure full of music, laughter, and friendship on Dice Populi. Listen to these stories and more at DicePopuli.com. Okay, so we were just having a conversation behind the scenes, and I was like, we need to have this conversation on camera. So <laughs> here we are. We're back. Hooray! <laughs> uh, so we were having a conversation about the need for there to be, like, TTRPG taverns. Like, you know, you've got your board game bars and, you know, stuff like that, and your your barcades and, and all of those kinds of things. But, yeah, we have one in the town next to us. It's a barcade. Um yeah. And uh, and so we were just saying that there needs to be something like that for TTRPGs. And then, of course, we got on the topic of speakeasies. And <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, the next thing that popped into my head is, OK, how come we don't have something like a blockbuster, but for TTRPGs where you could like rent out TTRPG systems to try out, but then you could have a speakeasy in the back where you could actually go and play? That's, that's what the tavern would be. Yeah. It'd be you you mix you mix the community library with with the the, the beer. Yeah. There was a tavern like that when I used to live in Wisconsin. Um, actually, where I started uh, GMing for the first time ever. Uh, there was a um, oh, in I used to live in Milwaukee, and there was a uh, bar called uh, Oak and Shield. Uh, that was like a gaming bar situation, but every Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> it became just a TTRPG bar, and so they would have drop-in games of all kinds. I obviously did D&D, but anybody could show up. I wrote, wrote so many one-shots for just random people, and there were like shelves of, of games and things you could try out and play. Um, sadly, it closed during the pandemic, but uh, 
but yeah, I mean, it was great. They used to pay me in drinks, which was fantastic. I love it. Best <laughs> so, way to get paid. Yeah, right. yeah, you got like a five dollar, five dollars worth of drinks if you had four people. If you had more than four, you got ten dollars worth of drinks. It was fantastic. Nice. Um, they had like wooden cups, you know, where you, they would pour mead into for Amazing. you. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Um, but that, that was, yeah, that's how I started playing, D, uh, DMing or GMing, uh, which is yeah. <laughs> as all I know, good adventures in a tavern. I know I've had this conversation with Duval of, we just need to have like a TTRPG getaway where we just rent the castle in England and everybody just goes over and we just play yes. TTRPGs yeah. for a week and a half. Um, I just posted something <laughs> like that on Twitter not too long ago and people were like yeah and then somebody was like don't they still do D, &D in a castle and i'm like yeah but it's like three grand a person and that doesn't even include airfare or food or anything yeah. <laughs> like no. you're literally paying three grand to pay D to play D. &D. <laughs> and yeah. while i love D, D, it's a bit much right yeah no. <laughs> just a, a bit um, there's i just moved to um providence uh a couple months ago and I live a couple blocks away from the um, Dexter Fort, which is literally a castle that they trained, um, well, I want to say World War One units in. Um, but now it's just, a, the castle's still there, but like there's a park grounds attached to it. And I just, I want it, I want it to be like the home base for like a convention. Like just, <laughs> just instead of going to the, the, the hotel or the or the uh, uh, convention center. You just you bring them into that ambiance. You can have you can even have booths outside at the park. Like I just I want that to be a thing. Yeah. You paintball at the very least. Yeah. Just go to a major convention location and not even go to the con. Just have an Airbnb where people can come and go. Right. You're the yeah. cons. You're the con suite outside of the con. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're uh, they're filming uh, Hocus Pocus two there right now. Oh my god! Oh, oh nice. Cool. Yeah. Or they were like two months ago. <laughs> Interesting. I I think something like that would be super fun. I just I can't like. I'm like, yeah, I can't spend three grand to travel overseas. And then it was funny because it was really fun to watch the conversation kind of take on a life of its own with all these people that were like, we could meet up here and we could meet up here. And I'm like, yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope all of you people actually do get to do that. That would be great. <laughs> uh, all right. So diving back into the questions that we have. So. Um, the next question that we had actually came from Tale of the Manticore from John, um, and he wanted to know how high of a level do you play up to before you retire a character? Mm. As mm. long as the game goes and I don't die. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I want to I want to figure out how to just play a game to level twenty, see if it's even possible. I know level that there's some. Um, Adventures <laughs> out there um, that go up that high, but I've never had the chance to really play one. Yeah. I GM'd the game that I think was like a one shot at level fifteen because it was at the end of a adventure path I was helping a friend promote. But I've never actually played in a game that got me that far. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've... I there you go. No, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, I I've never the only time I played a character beyond level eight was because my partner and I decided to, uh, when we were starting it that we had to start at level eight because we kept dying, or not, the campaign kept ending at level five or six. Uh, so I got all the way to like level, I wanna say 10, somewhere between 10 and 12, uh, but I cheated to get there, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how, what level my Pathfinder Society character would be because I played him in first edition organized play he survived, and then I brought him over into second edition organized play, but there's really no way to make that crossover with the character, with the exception of this is your background trait. So, like, right now he's level five, but he's probably a good eight or nine combined right now. Um, and he's been probably been the longest character I've actually played. I've played one shots of higher level, so I've played a 15, I've played a 20 one shot. Um, I played in a mini campaign, which the goal was for the last episode to be level 20. 
So we actually went first. The first one was level five. The next time we got together, we were 10. The next time we got together, it was 10, 15. And the last one was 17 or 17 and then 20. So we made sure we got up and we just leveled extremely quickly. Um, but I think the longest consecutive I got up to personally was eight. Ah. But my home campaign right now, we are at 12 and hey. going strong. So <laughs> I have plans to 20. I will let you know if we get there in the next two years. Uh, <laughs> nice. oh, I build out every character to level 20. It's a problem. It's a disease. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a disease. Uh, Follow up question. If you've been playing this like a returning character or the, a campaign for long enough, um, have, has, have your characters aged? As or like... Yeah. Because like the in in the time of adventuring is like a very jam packed period of like that in character's life, right? It's mm -hmm. years at tops. But like, has there ever been just campaign goes really long, or like you come back five years later, bring a character back and be like, he was level five, he's level eight now, and this is how far he's gone in life. Oh yeah, um, I mean, I always give my players a birthday, a oh, character's right. a birthday uh, when I make them. Because I was like, there was a game I played for a while. It was a cyberpunk D and D game where I played a seventeen year old. Everybody else played like full adults, and I played a seventeen year old. We were like level ten, so he was like a super. He was like a genius wizard kid, and so we did a whole session that was his eighteenth birthday, which was very very fun. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he was like a an apprentice of a like very rich company, and he became an heir on his eighteenth birthday, and it was a whole big deal, which is very fun. Um, but I was like, yeah, that's definitely as a player one of the highest levels I've ever played. I think I've like a level eleven out there. That I'm, I have a couple of games that are supposed to go to twenty. We'll see if they get there. That's um, always the question: <laughs> is I have it planned. Will we actually do it? Yeah, the uh, Fey Earth game that I mentioned earlier, the Fey Wild Earth game, is going. At least I'm DMing it, and it's supposed to go to twenty. I have a a boss that they should fight. And can only fight at level twenty because it'll be too hard otherwise. Yeah. Um, and so, and they know what's happening, and they know what's coming. So I'm like, come on, we'll get there. If you're level, they're level fifteen right now. I'm like, they'll get there soon, someday soon. <laughs> <laughs> just, just beyond reach. <laughs> I mean, I've never had them age. I mean, to be completely honest, like we did the calculations for my home game and they're level 12, but they've been adventuring for eight weeks. Exactly. So like it's I mean, it's one of those like in real time, we've been playing for three years. So it's not like I can be like, oh, we've only been adventuring for eight weeks. You're level four. Like, no, you, you can't do that. That's not fun for players. But yeah, I mean. I think that is why, as a DM, I'm starting to think about maybe I should be doing more downtime, letting them do more like that. Like, they had downtime at one point, but it's not something we regularly do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, kind of an important thing to think about of, you know, you get levels 1 to 20 in really like three months, realistically, in a game. Um, unless you actually plan downtime and travel time and things like that. So, yeah, but um, I as in terms of aging for my characters um the level eight character was the first campaign i've ever played in and i loved her and i was so sad that i never got to play her higher than that so she's a level 20 character in my campaign that they can find as an npc 20 years later <laughs> so, so she's there if they find her <laughs> yeah, i love awesome. doing that yeah, yeah. Almost I don't think all we... yeah sorry oh i was, I was gonna say i don't think i've ever tracked ages for characters but in my old high school game, we knew that one year had passed of in-game time because that's when our characters always got together and somehow burned down an inn. So. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm the worst. I give my players, like, star signs, you know, everything. <laughs> See, I wish my players did that. I Like, I created a moon cycle system for my world. I want someone mm -hmm. to pay attention to that. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Ask me what moons are in the sky on any given day. I can tell you. <laughs> in my Star Wars game, I had to keep track of time because, of course, this was like the dark times leading up to A New Hope. So I had to keep track of, I think, maybe two, two and a half years of in-game time had passed and they went from level one to level eight. So, Yeah, I, I kind of agree with Rusty. Like, I've noticed a lot of games. It's like, for some reason, eight is that magic number where everybody just 
stops. I, I think it's, that's more about being like adults and scheduling issues more than anything else. That has. <laughs> Yeah. See, I'm lucky. I have my husband who really wants to play and we have nobody else to play with. I have a couple friends that just really want time away from their kids once in a while. And a friend that is like, I have now figured out what nerddom is and I want all of this all yeah. of the time. Yeah. So <laughs> good combo. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, only Dan's is supposed to go to level 15. So we'll see if we get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck. There yeah, and beyond, well hopefully. Yeah, one level per arc. We're level four right now, so... <laughs> Hope is still there. Yes. It's all planned out. Well, we'll see. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I've had a character age, you know, like, significantly over the course of playing a campaign. Although, um, I do... I know I've mentioned it in the past, but I do listen to the Lawful Great Adventures podcast, and in their first season... Um, a lot of their characters celebrated birthdays during during the season, so it it wasn't necessarily an entire um, episode based around it being their birthday, but there was like a good chunk of time devoted to like how do you spend your time now that it's your birthday? You know, it oh somebody spent time making you a present and you know things like that. So you really that and the other thing is um, they he. Ben, their DM, gives the date at the start of every episode, which I think is a really neat way to kind of help you get a better sense of just how long these people have been traveling or how far they've gone and, um, you know, in any give, given period of time. And I just think that's a really cool way to do it. You know, it's not necessarily the, you know, it's not the date. It's obviously the in-date world, the in-world date. Yep. Um, and, uh, and it is just a really cool way to, to sort of be like, oh, wow, okay, so there was, you know, two weeks passed between the last episode and this one or whatever it might have been. Um, and it just helps give a, a better sense of time. So, Yeah, and if I remember, like, Ben is the master of downtime and travel time. So good at it. <laughs> He's so, so good incredibly at it. good at it. Like, I do not understand how, how he's that good at it. Yeah, yeah. But, like... He's the one that I talked to about downtime and travel time at first. It was like, yeah, okay, more, yeah, okay, what yeah. else? What else do I do? <laughs> yeah, it's, he does such a great job with it. And like, and also um, really making it feel like the resources that his cast has, that those resources are important and they have value in the world. Um, you know, they might, he might say, okay, what do you, what are your camp activities? And they don't devote a ton of time to it in the podcast, but um, you know, somebody might say, oh, I wanted to do some more work on this, you know, weapon that I'm crafting or something like that. And so he'll say, okay, that's going to take X amount of resources that you have. And I feel like that's just a really great way to do it too, because it gives value to the things that are in the world. So like, oh, I have X amount of this particular type of wood. I really need, you know, this other type of wood for what I'm trying to do, you know, it's bendy or whatever, you know? And so it gives it a value for trade, even though I don't think that's, I don't think that's his intention with it, but that's essentially what it does in my mind. So it just makes it feel like the world is like, it makes it feel like the world has more value in it than just kind of a, the only place you can get your resources is by going to a shop. <laughs> yeah. And I think like the thing about that too is, I know a big issue that my players have is like they don't know what they want to do. Like, what do you guys want to do in your downtime? I don't know. Let's keep going. So it's things <laughs> like <laughs> with that, it's like he gives them many goals. Like, yeah. okay, I need to do this thing. I need to learn this skill. And now they have something else that they need to work for that isn't go find the thing, bring the thing back, defeat the monster, get the gold. Yeah. In Star Wars, it was always, what are you doing when you're doing a hyperspace jump? And then that was sort of yeah, like yeah. all the party being together in one place, which had some pretty good uh, role play moments with that as well. I've been playing a game of Traveler, and that's like a big part of Traveler is the in-between time when you're flying from planet to planet. Like you have to decide which skills you're practicing and things just to get better. It's like written into the rules, which is very fun. Mm -hmm. I was like, as you mentioned a DM like telling you what date is, I just texted two of my games being like, here's the date. 
this is what day it is. <laughs> Just so you know, because I know what day it is, but I realize I don't tell my players that all the time. And uh, mm -hmm. and that's, I should, that's fantastic. That's such a good yeah. idea. Uh, yeah. So I just yeah, texted two of them right now. I was like, okay, it's, you know, one of them, it's August 19th. Like, <laughs> oh, hey, that's you know? my birthday. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I'll also mention that to them. <laughs> and be like, by the way. <laughs> no, kidding. Um, yeah, it, and it is. It's such an easy thing to do. Like, and it's such an easy thing, like, it, assuming that you have, have sort of paid attention as the DM as to how much time has passed, it's such an easy way for everybody to stay on top of how long they've been traveling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, another way that I've done that too is I've actually given them magic items that take so long to recharge. Mm -hmm. um, which, because of the way they play, I have knocked that time down significantly so they can actually use it more often <laughs> since they you know, don't do a lot of downtime and, you know, all of that. So, yeah, that's another way where you can kind of give them time passage and give them a reason to pay attention to how long things are taking, too. Um, who was it? Abyssal Brews also made the campfire system um, oh, for their... Like yeah. So, <laughs> basically, like, that middle ground between travel and encounters and, you know, being able to use some of that RP and, and um, you know, like what happens in the 15 minutes after a battle or that sort of thing, which I haven't personally gotten to use it, but I have it and I've read through it and it is, it's a really neat idea. And I, I feel like those are times, at least in games that I have played, those are times that can be so great for character development and RP times between your party members that I feel in my experience are way underutilized. Um, mm -hmm. And I would love to have more opportunities to to use that time. But, yeah. So I think that's... Great... Uh, oh, sorry. I was say, there's another great book that I just used. I just used an Only Dance, because I'm going to keep plugging that show. Yeah, definitely. Um, there is a... Uh, this is called, like, The Ultimate PC Backstory Guide, which is a very commercialized book, but it's very good, as... I know a lot of my the players hadn't thought a lot about what their backstory was, so I just took a bunch of questions from that book and my character because it was an only dance we're doing a rotating DM mm -hmm. list, so I so we also have PCs, so I was the first DM for the first hour. Now I'm gaming. Yes, yeah, it's always a Dan. Everyone's a Dan. <laughs> uh, we're we are getting a new, a new Dan for this next arc as well, a a, a Dana, but you know, <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, so I was a. So I used my PC to be like, hey, here's a list of questions about what is your character like? I don't know you. We just met. So and to let everybody like flesh out their characters as well. Being like, what is your what is your character's favorite food? Like stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, um, that was bit around a campfire is why. Because I also have the campfire book. So I used, I used a little bit of both and it was yeah. very, very fun. Um, they mostly were at the end were like, just go to sleep to my character because they were all trying to let go to sleep. But, I, <laughs> but it was very fun. Uh, <laughs> I got to do, uh, I did get to do a, a one shot with a DM. This was years ago. And it was basically we had a couple of weeks where somebody in the party was traveling so we ended at a rest period and then we took the next couple of weeks where the dm did like a one shot with two party members and then i played you know a one shot one on one with the dm and um so it was basically like what are you doing during this time that you're resting in this fortress or wherever it was that we were mm -hmm. and um and it was just that alone was just a lot of fun both for character development but just to be like is this something my character would do? Is this not something my character would do? You know, like, um, and and really get a chance to get to know my character a lot better so that when we all came back together as a table, um, you know, we all had sort of that extra backstory that, um, you know, <laughs> that and we had the player who was able to wake up and had to try to figure out why he was hogtied over a fire trap in a <laughs> fireplace at the place that we were <laughs> Camping, <laughs> and I definitely had nothing to do with the fire trap. Nothing. <laughs> it was not me. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I mean, it was just, and it was just a fun way too to interact with each other's characters, even though not everybody was there to respond at the time, but like seeing the end result, you know, like, okay, so everybody wakes up and oh, by the way, you're missing 20 gold and you're hogtied over a fire trap. And you know, and everybody was like, oh my God. So it was really fun to start the next session having to figure out like, okay, who took my stuff and why am I here? And <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was good. It was a good time. <laughs> That was very fun. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Keone the Dim has a good question. Uh, Keone is a uh, an up and coming DM who who has a question for the DMs. How do you get rid of the DMing jitters when it is your very first time being a DM? Ooh, I have a long answer. Someone else go first. <laughs> yeah, I have. Um, a quick, I'll say I have a quick answer. Yeah, um, but... Occasionally, I like to have a beer. I was going to say, Chat's answer was alcohol. So, yeah, I, like, occasionally I, like to have a beer. Um, I also, you know, I, I really try to embrace the jitters, honestly. If you can, uh, your players are nervous too. Mm -hmm. You know, they might not be as nervous, but they are also nervous. They don't know who they are. You know, you, like no one knows if it's if you're just starting a game. No one knows who, who their character is. You don't know your, actually who your character is, I think, until at least five sessions in. Mm -hmm. You can, kind of can live in this person for a little bit. So, you know, just and it's a game with your friends. And even, even if it's not, you know, if it's people you just yeah, just met. They'll, well, I mean, I play I do a lot of games with pe I, people that I've never met before. Uh -huh. uh, but um, they will understand if you're like, I don't know, uh, let's I'll figure it out. And then you give me a second. I need a break. That's fine. You know, it'll be fun. <laughs> well, one of the things that I remember doing, because I was this my Star Wars game that I ran for like two and a half years, I started as um, a brand new uh, DM for. And um, I remember like while we were trying to figure out what people wanted to do on their turn, if I wasn't familiar with the rules, I would ask that player to look up the rules for me. So like everyone was helping to contribute to do a quick reference in regards to how can we just keep things moving a little bit when everyone's so new to what the system was. Mm. Um, so that was very helpful. And then um, just sort of describing to your players, hey, this is the first campaign I've run, just please don't mind if I have to look something up real quick that I'm not really that much up on. and. You know, usually people are very willing to, to work with you on that. Yeah, I think for me, looking back on it, you know, I've been doing it for a couple of years now. I think there's there's three way there's three things that will help you kind of reduce them as much as possible. One is do a session zero, no matter if you are doing a one shot or not. You then can talk to your players and get everything out on the table immediately of this is my experience. This is your experience. What do you guys want out of this? What do I want out of this? What do we all want to avoid? What do we all want to do? And that will kind of set you up of I don't know what they want into I know what they want and I can do that. Uh, step two, <laughs> if you are if your goal is to let your friends and players have as much fun as possible, you're going to do just fine. And all, in all honesty, if your goal is to give you and your players a good time, you're going to be a fantastic DM. And then I guess for my third one is surround yourself with people who want you to succeed. If you have people that are telling you, you're going to do great, this is going to be fantastic, don't even worry about it, we're all in this together. It's so much easier than if you know you have that one player that's going to nitpick everything you do. And then really what should be is the other players at the table should tell them to shut the F up and let them do their thing. <laughs> like that's, right. that's when your players need to step in and be like, you need to stop being such a Royal butt and just have some fun with the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Be a peasant, butt. <laughs> yeah, be a peasant, butt. come on. That's uh that session zero can actually help you with what your kickers want to do on downtime. That was that. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Me too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Love um, a session zero. Oh, sorry. Oh no, that's it. Okay. Uh, and now for the so, long answer. <laughs> no, I love that. So, so I, I agree with mo mostly the uh, sense of being with people that want want to be around you uh, uh, will make the even if things go wrong, not feel like they're going wrong. Um, 
But I'm, I want to answer it actually specifically from the uh, the jitters specifically. Um, the sensation of having jitters technically never goes away. You only get better at or used to having them show up. Uh, uh, the the sensation of fear and excitement are the same things in our brains. Uh, and the difference is how you are emotionally uh, responding to it. Mm. So it's uh, it's the same thing with uh, stage fright. Um, no one doesn't experience stage fright. Uh, people that get on stage and enjoy it are instantly connected to the high. People that get on stage and hate it are terrified of the high. Uh, it's not better or worse, but the more you expose yourself to it, the more empowered you feel by that sensation. Uh, and because we all suck when we start, uh, the, the question is, uh, does the pain of sucking hurt more than the joy of playing? Uh, and the and when the joy of playing is greater, we come back again and again. And then again, the, exa the jitters don't go away. You just start to embrace them and they become part of that experience you're looking for. Um, so having this building an environment, like you have said, uh, that encourages you to succeed or people you are comfortable with, maximizes the chance that you enjoy it enough to want to come back, even though it was terrifying. Also to add on to that, because you said that and I was like, oh yeah, that I remember that now. Um, like you said, the anxiety and excitement that you feel are the same thing. They have done literal studies on this. If you are nervous and you just look at yourself in the mirror and go, I'm excited, yeah. I'm excited. It will actually switch it over. Your brain will start thinking the other way. I yeah. don't know why it works. It actually works. Yeah. <laughs> I've done it myself. But yeah, apparently just the state of being nervous and then just saying to yourself, I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited, will actually switch your brain over to the positivity, which sounds stupid, but it's true. <laughs> this isn't just for the DM jitters. It's anytime you're approaching something new or unfamiliar, like the... The ability to try something new is a skill in its own right because you get used to feeling that jitter sensation. And you'll also find too, I, I don't, I, I say I don't DM. I should, what I should say is I haven't DM'd in over 10 years um, because of something that just came up and I was not surrounded by people who were super like, they were they basically went into it trying to break the game and so it was a very negative experience for me mm -hmm. and basically turned me off from ever wanting to dm anything ever again um so of course i'm now telling I'm you when you do your wagons and wizards <laughs> i'm at that table <laughs> i am there uh yeah so so i keep saying i'm like i'm really i'm gonna dm this wagons and wizards game it's a little one pager that i found and and uh anyway and so i uh i just i it's so tough, but it, you're so right in the fact that like going into it with a mindset of like, this is going to be okay. It's going to be great. It's going to, you know, I can do this. There's a lot to be said for that mindset. And I know it's really challenging, but like, you know, I getting a little broader, but you know, like I've done a lot of stuff over the last year that like, that was the mindset that I absolutely had to approach it with. And it works. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it works. <laughs> and I think the one thing to remember to coming from the DM side, you are not the DM for everybody. So someone may not enjoy the way you DM. That right. doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It just means you guys don't have the same play style. I know a couple DMs that I think are amazing DMs and I can't play with them. But that's because of the way that I like to play. They're not doing it wrong. It's just we don't mesh. I can watch them do their DMs on streams yeah. and they, I will sing their glories forever, but I can't play with them. And that's not a bad thing. No. I was like, yeah, and getting a little a little personal with the nervousness. I just recently got diagnosed with some acute tremors, right? Mm -hmm. Which anytime I am stressed, my hands shake a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. But I found recently, because it just, just happened, but when I, like, earlier today, I ran a game that I love. I had no tremors, like, the whole time. And it's like, if you love what you're doing, you'll fe you won't you will feel the stress that comes with the DM, with DMing as much as you normally will. Even, if, even though it's there, it's more fun than stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think you have to just allow yourself to feel. 
you know, yep. a um, you assume it's going to be stressful and you assume it's going to be scary, but it's it's really you're playing a game. Yeah, you know, it'll be fun, uh, and you just have to focus on it being fun. And, and give yourself better. some slack. You're gonna mess stuff up. It's okay. Those of us that have DM been DMing for years still mess up. Mm -hmm. G give yourself some leeway to grow and you know be new. It's okay. <laughs> It's about improv, right? Yeah. You know, like if something goes wrong, it's okay. Yeah. It's yeah. improv. And you know, whatever you plan is not going to happen anyway, because your players are going to mess with it anyway. So, you know, <laughs> it's, don't worry about it. You're going to have to figure it out on the fly anyway. Scenario, the, the worst case scenario, you have a group, group of people that have never played before, and they'll have no expectations. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, yeah, and there are DMs, too, like, you know, people that are, are, you wouldn't think still get nervous before sessions, but like David Tilstra, for example, like is very open about the fact that before every time they sit down to record uh, an episode of their podcast, he still gets nervous and he still has to work through all those nerves. But if you were to listen to him or to watch him play, you would never, ever know it. So, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. It's, it's really very cool. The comfort your players bring you once you get into the game is an amazing thing. So like you said, that's why you need to surround yourself with people who want you to succeed. Because, you know, there's that nervousness, but the minute you get into it, you suddenly forget that, you know, you are in control of this game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you are just sitting down playing with a bunch of friends to have a good time. Yeah. Yep. question we have is from Zeal Zaddy. And uh, what is the most difficult secret you've had to keep away from your players? Ooh. Wow. They just figured it out, so it's like the weight popped off my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for my players, our campaign has focused around the Dark Six, even though they haven't known it. Um, and that the Dark Six have been banished from the Material Plane. They cannot connect, they, they can have one follower, and they don't know who locked them away, but they've been locked away. And the only way they have connections is through these shards that they've been trying to find. And they literally just made the connection between all of the information they just had and finding their way into the Dark City and asking questions, and they just made the connection that each of the shards contains the essence of one of the Dark Six. So I am just excited that they have figured it out. Like, this is how they can release them back into the world if they so choose or hide them from the people that want to do that. So now they have to make the decision what they want to do with these shards, which they have three of the six at this point. So that was a hard one for me to keep oh, from yeah. them, especially since I made this campaign and one of my players went, I'm going to be a paladin. <laughs> Can I have my, uh, my, the god I follow be the shadow? <laughs> yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> but yeah. it's like I had made this campaign and then I got the characters. I'm like, how in the world did you pick one of the obscure gods? <laughs> so I've had to hide that from them as well. And it's my husband, so it's even worse. Oh, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> Uh, I I have um, the biggest secret for me was um, when I played the dread game of Long Mishy Ring because you have to you're you have to get everyone to the point in which the tower gets knocked down without the tower falling and you can't tell them anything. Uh, the game is ninety percent most fun for the DM because they know what's going to happen and you get that shock on their faces when it does. Um, uh, and um, you can't really give away the story, so you're like you have nothing to sell the game on except from hey, let me uh, and, until that moment happens, and then you can like explore the actual story of the world. Uh, so that was difficult. Um, uh, the other is uh, in my home games, my partner is always playing with me, uh, so one of us tends to DM, uh, the other tends to play, and. Uh, we have to, we normally rely on each other for creative uh, processing and we can't because 
Spoilers! <laughs> oh, I feel that on such a deep level. <laughs> I think uh, the um, secret I haven't been able to share with my players as of yet is something that we have yet to do because we haven't gotten to a new session of our Star Wars game. But they've encountered some... Um, remnants sort of nomads of the uh fricata race from the knights of the old republic games oh yeah and they've already seen in some fashion that darth vader is connected to what they're currently doing and um what my players do not know that none of them should be here in this chat is that um some of those ricotta are going to get their force powers back. Ooh. And they're going to have to deal with that. <laughs> That's very cool. I haven't played Star Wars sometimes. Every every time you keep talking about Star Wars, I'm like, damn, I haven't played the Star Wars game in a while. I love Star Wars. I need to get on that. Um, I, got, like, I just want to be a Jedi. <laughs> yeah, so I've got a shelf of Star Wars comics behind me. God. Um. <laughs> The whole campaign started because there was a comic I was reading and it was taking place during the Clone Wars before Order 66 happened. And there was these two Jedi in the background of a single panel that to this day have no entries in any Star Wars database ever. So I'm like, these are the two that's going to launch the story for this campaign. And the players are actually flying around to this day in the Jedi ship. Because they were there, one of the players was actually taking part of the battle on this planet from this comic book. Fighting alongside that Jedi. And he was one of the clones that didn't turn. But um, there was an NPC who I actually created just because... Um, the players put him through such such a guilt trip about the whole order 66 thing he just wanted to make amends so i threw as a surprise to one of the other players that oh yeah that was the guy that drew his gun on you when the order went down and um in the in that in combat encounter when i introduced the npc that player with his backstory literally took a jetpack and did like a jetpack punch to this guy's face. Uh -huh. So he's like, I'm sorry, you totally deserve that. <laughs> Hell yeah. But yeah, that one that one panel from that comic, it's a single panel, basically started that campaign for me. That's wow. awesome. I like it. Yeah, and I'm like, should I look through my comics and try to find the panel? <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> I built the whole campaign off of the Red Robin series uh, from 2011. Oh, there you go. Very fun. <laughs> I had a character um, completely unknown to everybody. Well, it wasn't a secret per se. Just nobody noticed the fact that one of my character's eyes changed color. And, uh, and that was interesting. Um, she had been, <clears throat> she had been spending a lot of time with, uh, like an NPC sort of, you know, off camera training and, and whatever. And so as part of what she had been learning, uh, she had been drinking these potions repeatedly and through the course of drinking these, these potions, it changed her eye color because she drank it so frequently. <laughs> Wow. Yep. But cool. uh, but nobody nobody caught on to it, so <laughs> say, So this is best... the first time anybody that was familiar with the character would have heard <laughs> that her eyes changed color. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, it's it was funny because they went from being uh, from being green to being like a like a honey color. So <laughs> very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Say so my best secret was there was a guy who was a like city finance guy who was <laughs> trying to foreclose on some local businesses. Who's just a pain in the ass. Who's really stoic guy. Who would just like, you know, they would charm him and he would leave. Blah blah, blah for several sessions. 
This guy was a Rakshasa the whole time. Oh! <laughs> yes! <laughs> um, they had many interactions with him. He was like, a, he like you know, just like casual dude with a mustache, very like buttoned up, normal dude for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And they find out, wait, this guy is, the money he's getting when he closes these businesses, he's like investing in like very interesting like properties. He's actually super rich. Why is this guy super rich? Uh, and yeah, he was the like main villain of a whole arc that they just like hung out with for like he was just a pain in the ass for weeks oh it was so fun love i love rock shots rock shots yeah. are fantastic so, oh so good and they're like yeah but our it, spells that are under six level don't work on them i'm like no they can choose to make them not work on them uh so you think your spell does work because they're like yeah no this is a charm person sure why not <laughs> who cares <laughs> let's see where this goes let's make yeah, my exactly. life interesting today exactly and so uh that was so fun uh i don't do a lot of secrets i'm so bad at keeping them most of the time it's like one session later i'm like here is here's the fun thing that happened that you didn't <laughs> notice last time uh but that one was probably the longest running one I've done. that There's is one of the harder day. things of dming is not telling somebody the secret because you that they didn't find because you so badly wanted them yeah. to find it. <laughs> yep. The oh the God. dreaded planning a secret that never comes to air. Are you sure you don't want to look in that closet? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> There's some cool stuff in there. <laughs> I've done a lot of like handing my characters um post-it notes, usually when a secret from their backstory is about to make a presence in in the actual session itself being like yeah mm -hmm. you you you're the only one who recognizes this you're the only one who recognizes this let's see how crazy this now gets yeah <laughs> do you reveal to the other party members whether or not you know this or not yeah even if you don't make a, a save like you know you would notice this that doesn't matter you know yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's very cool no, i also did this thing where like we would start the campaign at level two if they just wrote me a backstory so like, yeah, if you've already been around doing things for a while, then great, level bump, let's do it. Although I think one of my favorite things to do, it's not really keeping a secret, but it kind of is of, um, so I had this whole arc under, this whole under dark arc planned for my group and they outsmarted me. Uh, <laughs> so it was, they were going into this mine and there were monsters coming out of this crack in the mine from the ground. And as a DM, you're thinking, okay, they'll go down into the crack. They're going to figure out where these monsters are. And they're like, is there a wizard in town? I'm like, yeah, I play a pretty high magic area. They're like, do they know shape earth? Yes. <laughs> 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 so they just did the smart thing and just closed the crack. Yeah. And what I did, and I have now found this is one of the best ways to get my character, my players interested. I picked up the notes for the arc and I just threw them behind me and we kept going. And I have never had them so interested in what we were doing <laughs> at that point. So now that's what I will do is if they circumnavigate something, I throw a sheet of paper over my shoulder that had the plan on it. Yep. And they are suddenly they're, they're in it again like <laughs> they're just <laughs> hyper focused so that is another one for you if you just want to put some fun moments in there let them know when they outsmarted you and just yep. show them show them literally that you're throwing the plan out the window <laughs> i have they had so much fun with that one moment and it wasn't a game thing, like an in-game thing yeah let them let them let them know they had the victory yep they beat me and you know what congratulations <laughs> because i should have thought about that Oh, that wizard we know, does he know this spell? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah. well, the bad guys are down there doing something, so I guess that's going to succeed. Okay. <laughs> if it's not like a secret to a future session, I'd be like, okay, you did things X way, but I was planned for Y and Z. Just so you're aware, this could have gone a lot differently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's also why I guess my plan is always, I plan what the enemy is doing. Mm -hmm. So that no matter what they choose, it's whether or not they circumnavigate this thing that's happening in the background. And it's easier for me to improv at that point because I'm like, oh, I know what they're doing. You have either circumnavigated it, you stopped it, or it happened, depending on what you guys choose. So. Yeah. I feel like 
feel like that's really important too. Like I am a big proponent of making sure that the world still is going on around. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's, I think about like video games like Skyrim, for example. I love Skyrim. Yeah. It's a great game, but like I could do 60 hours of side quests and never touch the main quest, but mm -hmm. nothing happens because that's, it's a video game. That's how it's mm -hmm. built. Like it, it's really hard to be continually making it like, okay, you didn't get to X place in two hours. So why bad thing happened, you know? And, um, and I really like when, when there's sort of that sense of urgency in a game, like if we don't get there, like if we don't stop screwing around and actually try to complete this thing, then, you know, the, the town's going to fall through a, you know, giant sinkhole or whatever, you know, I, I really like feeling like there will be a consequence in the playing. If I, if we spend too much time, like I want to talk to that random goblin in the corner, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, th I think that's really important. I think um, particularly because uh, for some players or a lot of players, the idea of the character actually dying as opposed to failing a quest uh, is a, can be hard. But there, I do think for um, for a story to be worthy of being told, which is what we're, we're creating a story, kind of, um, uh, it has to exist in a uh, far end of the spectrum of regular life. Like, the reason it's worthy of being told outside of, like, this is what I did today, is because the characters or the situations are, like, greater than normal. Um, uh, so that means in order to create that, uh, the character has to, like, have consequences that they have to overcome or, like, decisions that make them grow. And it doesn't mean they have to face death all the time. So, like, the world moving because they made a choice is a way to have a consequence that isn't fatal. Right. And makes them go, oh, I made my, my consequences of actions. Um, now I have to grow from this moment. Yeah, the Imperial Assault board game did this really well, because I think if you play a full sort of like um, campaign with the game, it's like 10 different sessions. And there's twice during the mission tracks where they give you two options and not one. And you could get an option that says, oh, look, this is a 501st garrison training facility. Do you attack it? Or do you do this other mission over here? And if you don't resolve it, guess what? Later on, you're fighting members of the 501st. Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. 100%. Plan for what the antagonist is doing and let the choices affect that. I feel like that is the best way to make their choices matter. Yeah. Is, you know, did you do the thing or did you not do the thing? Right. Is part of it. But what it, did your choices affect what the antagonist is doing? Yeah. Because yeah. I've had a couple moments on that, like, my antagonist has shifted course because of stuff that the players have done. And even though they may not know that, it's going to come to light. It's going to come to light sooner or later. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I just feel like that's it, the easiest way to learn how to improv the situation and to make choices matter. Uh, I agree. All right. Well... I think we have wrapped up. We managed to answer all of the questions that we got tonight. And we're at a great point that uh, we need to start wrapping up for the evening. So what I would like to do is have everybody uh, will go around again and just remind us of who you are and where we can find you on the Internet. And if you have any projects or streams or podcasts or anything coming up that you want to uh, shout out, please feel free to do so. So we're going to go in the reverse order from when we started. So Star, we're going to start with you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Star Shinobi. I'm at Star Shinobi on Instagram, Twitter, and DMs Guild. Um, I am currently playing on a Pathfinder 2E Strength of Thousands campaign every other Thursday on Waffles Maple Syrup called Outcast and uh, Outcast and Outclassed. Can't talk today too much. Um, we'll be resuming that back in March when our GM gets back from her trip. Um, in addition to that, I am restarting the what used to be called the DN or the Daily D and D Magic Project as the Magic Rolo Dex oh. <laughs> instead. <laughs> so, uh, Which is a great name. I yeah. So, if, for anybody who doesn't know, the little character that I've created for this is Rolo Von Yolo. Whatever magic item he finds, he touches or drinks doesn't matter. He wants to know what it does. Um, so. Yep, Von Yolo. He does it whatever he wants. So the Magic Rolo Dex is going to be coming back. Um, I also was on Roleplay Chat, and that um, 
that episode will be coming out this week as we talk about magic items and how to um, essentially give your gift gifts to your players, give make giving them um, things like magic items or plot points or things of like that to keep them interested in the game. So that should be coming out on Wednesday, I believe, the 16th. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And thank you for choosing us over football. It was the right choice. Or alongside. <laughs> <laughs> Although or did, alongside, maybe we're doing both. Yeah, I was going to say I did hear that the uh, uh, that the halftime show was pretty darn amazing. If you were, into I mean, it was Snoop Dogg. So yeah, Snoop Dogg, <laughs> Dr. Dre, Eminem, Anderson Pac. Sorry, yeah. I did have it running in the background. Yeah. The real question is, it. how many times did they have to bleep Eminem? <laughs> all of them. I hope it's yeah, all of them. <laughs> I would love a just straight bleep for like two minutes. <laughs> just does does rap God and it's just beep. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but we were talking about like bets beforehand, the off bets that are happening on football. And one of them was whether or not Snoop Dogg was going to be enjoying recreationally on stage during the performance. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's, it's in LA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh. Well, Tale of the Manticore just updated us in chat. The Were Tigers are just about to lose the sports ball game. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, there is your sports ball update for this evening. And uh, so, Star, thank you so much for coming to hang out tonight. It's always a pleasure to have you. And uh, Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm glad you were here. Uh, Julian. Yes. Hi, Hi. everyone. Tell us uh, I am Julian, you. also known as Everyday Superhero. I am the host, um, bard, and happiness sorcerer of Ever uh, Everyday Superhero Cast. It's a monthly uh, nerdy health and wellness podcast that based around conversations of inspiration. Um, and um, I also have a budding new fitness TTRPG called Mission Quest that uh, infuses uh, basic home exercises in place of die, die rolls that you do to move the story along. Um, and currently, I am um, playing alongside and starring in the stream of, um, I know this, I'm a Medic Mori uh, on DMDM Studios. Um, it is a great time and my first time on a stream and I'm having so much fun um, playing Thimble as we uh, journey into the dark abyss. That's awesome, and, I, and I, I need to know more about this this TTRPG that you're creating. Uh, so anybody who hasn't followed any of my stuff on Twitter, I, over the last year, have lost over 100 pounds. So, awesome. <laughs> um, so I am definitely interested in that and would like to know more. <laughs> I have, it's technically already up and running. Um, I used, long story short, I used to own a gym that ran it as an in-gym class. That's so cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yep, and then, you know, the world exploded. And then uh, I went digital, and then I tried to find a way to make it work remotely. And and the, the key has been uh, on-demand video and uh, making it feel as much like a digital role-playing experience as possible until I ask you to do a push-up. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, everyone that's playing right now has been working working with me um, from a training standpoint for years, um, so cool. and now I'm building on tr getting gaining trust from the I uh, I only know it as a game aspect. That's really really cool. I yeah I definitely want to know more about this. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll I will talk to you. Um, awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was great to have you. Great to get to know you a little bit. And, um, you know, good luck with everything. It sounds like you've got a lot going on. Oh, so many, so many stoking parts and so many fires. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's see. Next, we'll go over to Danny. Hi. Uh, yeah. First thing, I used to be a Nazi stagehand and I've worked a Snoop Dogg concert. Uh, his, uh, DJ, I, I set up his little DJ stand. The DJ smoked seven blunts before the concert. Anyways. Um, but, well, there you go. Uh, so yeah, I've worked a lot of concerts. If you ever have questions about concerts, I know a lot of, I've worked with over a lot of famous people. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Um, but yeah, my name is Danny. Uh, you can find me on socials as DannyNet20 all over the place. 
I am a DM slash player on Only Dan's, uh, the only TTRPG for made by Dan's for everybody. Uh, we're always looking for more Dan's, so if you know anybody that has Dan anywhere in their name, uh, it can be part of your first name, it can be part of your middle name, it can be part of your last name. Message us, we are always looking to add players, we're swapping people out, adding people in, looking for new DMs for every arc. Uh, an arc is three to four episodes, so we're always, you know, swapping around. I did the first arc, our, my good friend Dangent Master is going to do the second arc, and it's going to be fantastic. Uh, it started out basically just, I was scrolling Twitter, and I was like, wow, there are a lot of people named Dan in my <laughs> Twitter feed. And so I just messaged everybody, and I was like, let's do a stream, and that's how that happened. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> Besides that, I am a DM for hire. I haven't been running a lot of games recently. I got a new job, so I've been working a lot. But you can always, uh, I am a, I rely heavily on comedy and jokes. I don't, nothing is serious when I DM. And so yeah. if you're looking for some crazy nonsense, I will roll with it no matter what. So uh, feel free to contact me and hire me. Uh, I'm always out there. But, uh, but yeah, that is my whole entire spiel. There's always more, but that is what I'll do tonight. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, it was great to get to have you on, too, and get to know you a little bit more. Also, um, uh, yeah, I, that was great. Yeah. I love it. I'll love come it. again if you want. <laughs> uh, hey, anytime. You all are welcome back. Anytime. And uh, Carlos. Hey, I'm Carlos Cabrera, and I have my freelancing work for Pathfinder and other projects at somethingclevergames.com. Uh, I've done a little bit of voice acting as well, um, so hopefully there will be more of that in the future, as well as an announcement of my new board game project, um, hopefully by the end of March. Awesome. Well, thank awesome. you so much for coming on and hanging out tonight. It was great to get to meet you. I know we chatted much. only via email, actually, so... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yep. So this was great. Well, thank you all so much for coming to hang out tonight and uh, for for talking TTRPG and uh, maybe also watching a little bit of sports ball. We appreciate you coming and hanging out. Reminder, there is no Tales from the Tavern next week. I am taking next week off because my daughter and I have plans to go to Boston and uh, and hang out down there because uh, because I know I'm going to get yelled at if I don't tell you all why we managed to score reservations at Gordon Ramsay's new restaurant down in Boston. <laughs> I just saw your tweet about that. What's that? I just saw your tweet about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so we're pretty darn excited about that. So, uh, yeah, during normal stream time, we will be eating dinner. And, um, so we will be back again the following Sunday. And, uh, then we'll, the plan right now is to plow straight through until, like, May. And then we'll go from there. So, um, yeah. So come back and see us again next Sunday. Uh, we're here uh, every week from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern time. And um, I don't think I have anything big coming up anytime soon. Um, yeah. No, that's about it. Uh, we do have, uh, for those of you who caught the first Crashlands uh, TTRPG session that we did back a few months ago. We're starting to talk about the second one because Matt had said that he was going to get that that all written up and I know that they've been doing some some uh, table reading of it at in his Discord so uh, be on the lookout for the, the part two of that coming up some probably sometime in the next few months. Uh, but that's about it. That's all I got. So we're going to uh, we're going to wind down the evening a little bit. And we're going to go raid some good friends of mine over at Turtles and Chill. And if you are not familiar with Turtles and Chill, it is a 24-hour stream of a turtle and fish tank. And that's it. It's all it is. And it's a great way to kind of wind down your evening or, uh, you know, just have some chill vibes in the background. So we're going to go over there. I hope you all have a great evening, and we will see you all in two weeks. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Tales from the Tavern. You can catch this podcast recorded live every Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific at twitch.tv forward slash GamerMomLuna. All of our questions come directly from chat, so we never really know what to expect when we go live. If you ever have a question or would like to add something to the conversation, feel free to reach out on Twitter at GamerMomLuna and use the hashtag TFTT. You may just get to hear it answered. Thanks so much. I should go.